Hello, I'm Colin Hung, editor at Healthcare IT Today, and I'm joined today by Charlie Harp, CEO of Clinical Architecture. Together, we're going to explore an area of healthcare that doesn't get a lot of attention, but really should, and that is cleaning and normalizing data so that it's of high quality and therefore easily consolidated and analyzed. Charlie, thank you so much for joining me today on the program. Oh, Colin, thanks for having me. Glad to be here. So, Charlie, let's start with an easy question, or I think it's easy. Uh, as the CEO of Clinical Architecture, you work with a lot of healthcare organizations. So what are you seeing in terms of the challenges that they're facing right now? Well, you know, we have a, a number of, you know, mid-sized to large healthcare enterprises that we work with. And one of the things that they're all kind of struggling with a little bit is how to get their arms around all the data. Because as, as the whole industry looks at the shift to value-based care, to do value-based care well, <clears throat> you really have to be able to communicate to the powers that be how you're doing, understand how you're doing, and then be able to leverage how you can improve how you're doing. So that means enterprise analytics, it means population health, quality measure reporting, CDC reporting requirements, meaningful interoperability, sharing data in a, in a meaningful and useful way. Um, and it's, uh, it all kind of revolves around this idea of how do you get your arms around, um, we have this, this metaphor at clinical architecture called the infra monster. It's, it's, uh, we, it's a whimsical representation of something that we had a hard time articulating when people were saying, what do you do? A lot of it was, you know, how do you describe the problem in healthcare with data? And so the infra monster is really this idea that you cultivate and you grow this thing because you think it's the right thing to do but uh, managing it is a non-trivial exercise. So I think a lot of people are, are trying their best to wrangle their infra monster to deliver the, the things they're supposed to deliver as a responsible organization in healthcare. So, so Charlie, before we got on camera, you were talking to me a little bit about why data quality is so important to solving some of these challenges that not only you just mentioned, but some of these other ones that are kind of we're facing now in healthcare. You know, why is data quality and data so important these days? Well, if you think about it, um, historically, data in healthcare was a byproduct of the process. We, we deliver services, we schedule appointments, and we, the byproduct of all that is, is the tsunami of data that we store, or we purge, or we do whatever. And that's the way it's been for a long time. The, the problem we have now is really data, whether you're a person or a healthcare enterprise, is, is how we learn, how we measure, how we understand the world around us. And we're in a time right now where, for many reasons in healthcare, being able to get our arms around the data and understand the data, it allows us to um, understand our world better, behave better, react better, and uh, make better decisions. Um, if, if you think about it, the biggest challenge is if you don't have data, you live in a world of uncertainty. It's like driving down the road with mud on your windshield. You would pull the car over if you couldn't see where you were going, right? That's true. That's true. Actually, I heard a, a statement that I, I love, and I, and I can't remember who said it, but you know, today we are healthcare providers that produce a lot of data. Tomorrow, we will be data companies that happen to provide healthcare. I mean, that's sort of the, the yeah. transformation that we're currently going through. Uh, and you can see it with precision medicine, with uh, personalized care, uh, with the ability to really segment um, uh, your patient populations into certain populations so you can provide better treatments and programs there. Uh, so you can definitely see this movement towards needing more data of higher quality in order to provide the, the services that we want. You're absolutely correct. I mean, think about it. Precision medicine is really data-driven medicine. That's absolutely right. That's absolutely right. So before we get any further, maybe you can help define for, for me and, and for our viewers, what is uh, high-quality data? What does that mean to you? Quality is one of those words that's kind of hard to describe. It's like beauty. It's in the eye of the beholder. But I'll give you my, uh, my definition. I call it the four C's of quality. Um, quality data is current it's not old it's it's current and up to date it's correct uh, in that it's not wrong um, it's complete you have everything you need um, and it's comprehensible you can understand it 
And I think you think about quality data. I, I think a provider could argue that I took notes and the notes are high quality data and I can read those notes and care for my patient. The difference here is when, when I talk about quality data in healthcare, I'm talking about if, if we want the software that we invest in and that we try to leverage to help us in a meaningful way to care for our patients, understand our populations, not only do the providers have to be able to look at the information and understand it, but the software has to be able to understand it. So this whole question of, you know, do you have the most recent information, not just in terms of what's going on with the patient, but what's going on in medicine? Do you have the right information? Is it the right patient? Is the data old or stale? Is that from 10 years ago and it's no longer true? Um, do you have everything you need? Because you know today they talk about 60 to 80 percent of what we know about a patient is an unstructured text, which is very difficult for software to, to get its arms around. And then the last thing is, can the system that you're using it in for analytics or whatever purpose understand it? And that's where you know, normalization and interoperability is critical because if the system can't understand it, it can't use it. I like your I like your uh, definition there, Charlie. You know, what what to me, it's almost like when we were back sort of in the early 80s, you know, when computers were just starting to be rolled out in enterprises and in healthcare organizations. Back then, we didn't have the networking infrastructure to really allow those computers to run very effectively. And yeah. so in a way, you know, we we led with the demand, which is, hey, I, I would like to use computing or computers in my workplace, uh, and then infrastructure caught up. It sounds like what you're saying is very similar in nature in the sense that, you know, we have these amazing tools and these amazing programs that we want to run, but we don't have the underlying data infrastructure yet to actually make them run. And so therefore now we're demanding that that be put in place. Yeah, you're absolutely right. We're also living in a world where we evolved out of these silos and in many ways, the way we think about data is still very siloed and that it's further exacerbated by the fact that, um, you know, I've dabbled in other industries. I've been in healthcare for 30 years, but when you, when you look at healthcare, one of the things that makes it fairly unique and one of the reasons why so many companies, you know, come to healthcare and they think, oh, it's healthcare, we'll just solve this problem. One of the reasons why it's kind of intractable is, is not, you know, because it's, um, it's not the people, it's not the system, it's the fact that healthcare evolves from the edges. Other industries are, tend to be driven from the center, but healthcare evolves from the edges because the people at the edges are actually encountering and, and evolving healthcare every single day. So you can't impose a system from the center. And because healthcare naturally evolves from the edges, we tend to stay in our silos. We create the terminologies we need. We, we follow the best practices we want in those silos. And you're right, we need to get better about, about uh, sharing that information across the silos and making sure that when I'm looking at a, a picture of a patient, I'm seeing everything I need to see to be able to deliver proper care. You know, just around that, uh, we've heard some talk around, you know, uh, maybe an improper way to approach these, this problem, and that is trying to gather everything at once about a patient and going after, you know, trying to bring all of it together at one time, meaning, you know, we have too much data already. Um, you know, is it better, Charlie, in your mind to start, hey, like, just start with the 60% you need and draw that in and get that working as opposed to try to go after the 100 that you already have, uh, the 100% of, of data that you already have and try to bring all that together at one time? Well, I, I think it's it's a little more insidious than that. It's a good point, but I, I think one of the challenges you have is um, if you look at the 60%, it, it's kind of like, um, you know, I want to win the lottery, so I only want to buy a winning lottery ticket. Identifying the 60% you need to make a good decision is challenging because how do you know that the critical thing that is going to make a difference for that one patient isn't in that 40%? The trick really is, this goes back to my definition of quality. Um, you don't need 100% of everything. You need a high quality picture of where the patient is right now. So the fact that they had a broken leg when they were 12 doesn't matter. Um, the fact that they took antibiotics seven years ago for an ear infection doesn't matter. So the question is, how do we get smart about you know, identifying the current state of the patient that's meaningful to what I need to provide their care? How do I know it's complete, it's current, it's right? Because you're, you can look at 1,800 pages of medical history, and that's 
all that's going to do is waste your time. What you really need to do is, is uh, still that information into a picture. And the problem we have today is you can't do that with humans alone. It's why we need to leverage the software because software, that's what it does. That's how it augments us as, as, a, as, a, as a species. It gives us superpowers in terms of processing data and accumulating things. Um, and all we need to do is feed it quality data. So you, you mentioned something I want to ask about. So you mentioned there about how, you know, you made it sound like there are some people still out there, and I've seen it as well, who are still doing some data consolidation very manually using very uh, antiquated tools, if you will. And yet we see a lot of uh, tools that are available on the market that, can, that are able to help with this. Um, why do you think these have not been adopted or what is the barrier to getting these adopted? I mean, I, I think one of those things is, is a very, it's a very noble thing. I think that, you know, people care a lot about what they do. It's, they're passionate about it. They know how important it is. And so it's, it's, uh, it's like self-driving cars. I think self-driving cars are really cool, but I don't know that I'd be willing to get behind the wheel of one right now. Um, the, uh, the, for me, when it comes to automation, the trick is to have automation that's smart enough to know when it's failing. Um, and, and that's one of the things that we've focused on is not just saying, hey, we'll automate this and we'll take it away. Focusing on the ability to let, give you a machine that you control, that you can, you can teach it to say, or it learns when it's failing and when to call in a human being. Because that's really, when you think about the human assets we have in healthcare that are doing things like normalization manually, they're valuable assets. They, they, and, and mapping and things like that, it's not the sexiest job. People don't say, I can't wait to go map. With that. Well, some people do. I know a lot of but it's one of those things where um, they just have to have faith that the computer and the software is not going to drop the ball and, and somebody will get hurt. And I think we're getting to that point. Um, I don't think that automation can do 100 percent. It's like it's like artificial intelligence and machine learning. I think it's still something that can augment us as humans uh, to help us do our job more effectively. Does that make sense? It makes total sense. I like it. I like how you said that. So, Charlie, let's get a little bit tactical here. But how is uh, clinical architecture? How does your product help customers? Well, um, you know, our mission is to develop innovative solutions that maximize the effectiveness of healthcare. That's that's our our mission statement. Mm -hmm. And what we really try to do is we try to put things in place that that remove the human burden. In fact, one of the things, one of the misnomers we have all the time is Typically, our products, medical, doesn't replace something that people have. It augments the things they have. You know, you make a billion dollar investment in a piece of software, um, you want to get to quality. And what we've found is that uh, oftentimes we dramatically decrease the time and dollars to get to a quality input so that the other systems, whether they're reports or analytics, um, can, can be much more effective. And that's that's really um, what uh, what makes me proud every day of the work that we do at Clinical Architecture is when we hear from our clients that a project that they thought was going to take five years is done in two months, um, wow. because that represents a huge amount of, of sweat, blood, sweat, and tears. And the other thing too is when people think about data quality, they tend to think that it's a project. You know, they they get done like, all right, data quality, good. But data quality, whether you're talking about normalization, master data management, any of those things, data quality is not a project. It's a lifestyle choice. Once you once you start down the path, there's the cost to get there, and then there's the cost to stay there. So, I like that. Data quality is a lifestyle. I like that one. That should be on a T-shirt, Charlie. We should put that. I'll talk to my marketing team right away. Oh, that's a great one. Um, maybe can you give us maybe a specific example of a project that you worked on that sort of has take you know would have taken this but now it was this because of of your tool? Sure, I, I won't name names, but I'll give you some examples. Sure. Um, uh, very recently, we cre we completed a project where we were asked to help someone normalize medications and labs for over a hundred facilities. Um, we got those to ninety five percent normalization. Um, to standards, Rx, Norm, and Loink, and we did it in about two months. Wow. Now, that's the kind of project where if you were putting human beings on it, mm -hmm. it would have been a five-year project easily. Wow. Um, 
We also, we had a client, uh, another client who we did some analysis with them using a, a handful of the tools we have in our medical solution. And we found 3,500 undocumented diabetics in a six month period in, in, oh. one, in one health system. Um, so in, in a lot of the things we do are really designed around um, just reducing time and effort. Because the biggest problem we have today when it comes to things like normalization, for example, people don't want to do it because they know how painful it is and how long it's going to take. And, and that's why you get people that are saying things like, um, I only gonna, I'm only going to map the top 100 or the top 50. And that goes back to my lottery ticket scenario. You know, if you map the top 100, you're, you're not necessarily going to find the winning lottery ticket. You got to scratch them all off to find the one that wins. And so um, our goal is to, is to take that fear and take that barrier of time and money and try to try to make it less of an issue so that people can get to quality. Because that's, at the end of the day, in clinical architecture, what we're really about is how do we help healthcare as an industry um, do all the amazing things that it should be able to do if we can just get through some of these, these issues that stop us from getting there. Gotcha. Wow, that's great. Those are two amazing examples. And uh, I definitely, you know, I would not want to be that person working on that project for five years. Let me put it that way. I don't know. It's job security, I suppose. <laughs> there is, I think there's one thing we both know about healthcare. There is no, uh, yeah. there is no lack of job security. There's That's always going to be another That's project. That's very true. That's very true. <laughs> well, this has been really uh, fascinating. Um, you know, Charlie, if someone was watching this video, uh, you know, what's the one thing that you would hope people would take away from it? Hopefully somebody's watching this video, Colin. The, <laughs> I mean, what, what I would say is, you know, regardless of how you do it um, and how you choose to get there, the sooner that people wake up to the quality, uh, the quality problem we have in healthcare, um, you know, we hear all about artificial intelligence and machine learning and all these things. But when you do artificial intelligence on bad, bad data, it's artificial uncertainty. It's, it's, my, my biggest concern when it comes to um, the data quality problem we have is that it, it sets us up as an industry for failure um, and it damages our credibility when we roll things out and we try to deliver on things, but we really can't do it effectively because of the quality of the data. Uh, healthcare, I've always said, one of the reasons why I love being in healthcare is healthcare is, is chock full of heroes. There are people from the providers to the, the people like me that live in the, who live in the basements and, and, and clack away at their keyboards. Um, but most people I've encountered in healthcare are really passionate about it. So, you know, I just want to see us as an industry achieve, you know, the vision of what we can be. And so I would say no matter how you fix it, look to your quality and, and improve it because it's important. Great. Charlie, if people wanted to find out more about what we've been talking about today and more about your company, where can they go? They can go to www.clinicalarchitecture.com. We'd love to hear from anybody. All right. Well, Charlie, this has been fascinating. Thank you so much. You produced, uh, you know, gave me uh, some really good information. You produced some really good one-liners here. You know, data <laughs> quality is a lifestyle. Uh, you know, having bad data and trying to apply AI means you get artificial uncertainty rather than artificial intelligence. Uh, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much for sitting down with me and with our viewers today. Thank you. Uh, excited to be here. Great. I'm Colin Hung, and this has been a Healthcare IT Today production. This is Charlie Harp, CEO of Clinical Architecture. Thanks for watching, and have a great day. Thank you.